Since you're here, go ahead and hit the like, subscribe button. So what you see before you today is a very, very famous Browning High Power. This particular one is by Fabrique Nationale, which is FN. As we go through today's video, I'd be remiss, and I don't want to belabor the point. We're going to do a little bit of history, got to tell you how we got here, and then we're going to do a tabletop on this guy, talk about the features, go around on the handgun itself, the particular one that I picked up from Classic Firearms, I wanted to add to my collection. And then we're going to take it out to the range and see how she does Browning High Power. Did you know it's almost 100 years old at this point? Oh man, John Moses Browning, you still live on, brother. Welcome back. Let's jump right in with the history lesson. So John Moses Browning, in the later end of his years, works with the Belgians, to design a couple new prototypes. Essentially, they were going after the French military contract that was released in the 20s for their military high-capacity pistol, similar to the 1911, but that wasn't patent infringed, that could be adopted by the French or Belgian militaries. So he did that. He created a couple prototypes, flew back over to Belgium, was working in the plant in and out of there as he's done many times throughout his career. He's with his son in the office. He decides to go out to the plant to take a break and he's not feeling well. And uh, unfortunately, he, he dies. What I'm going to try to do is there's some audio footage. I don't know if it was from the 70s or 80s or 90s of his son kind of describing the incident. I'm going to go ahead and splice that footage so we can kind of hear that unfortunate series of events. I got to my office and took out my coats and I went to my desk and he went out to make his tours of the shop and pretty soon came back. Said he wasn't feeling well. I called the factory doctor and he came up immediately. My father said, son, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm dying. And then the doctor felt his pulse again and said, well, he isn't doing well. And Gave him another shot in the, a deep shot in the leg. Something, I don't know what it was. And had to, after he got that shot, and within two minutes he was dead. Very unfortunate. Unfortunate indeed. We lost a legend. There's no doubt about it. Browning, alas, wasn't alone. He was working with a guy, I'm going to probably butcher his name, he was from a Belgium designer, Daudande Save. We're going to just refer to him as that. After John Browning's death, Save goes on to finish the pistol and eventually it enters service into Belgium in that country's military in 1935. And it was known as the Browning P-35, nicknamed Grand Puissance, otherwise known as the High Power, due to its revolutionary double stack box magazine. I mean, come on, capable of 13 rounds of freedom. How cool is that? The pistol was awesome because it had these tangent sights. It also shipped with a stock. It allowed it to, <laughs> the original version of an SBR could go out 200 yards. Effective range was 50 and uh, it was detachable. The Belgian government adopted a somewhat slightly different model of this in the late 30s. It was a little shorter and had a 10 round magazine with a short slide. Everybody else jumps on board as well. The Romanians adopted a model similar to the French M35 at around the same time. From there, we see that the high power served in World War II on both sides because Belgium, as you guys remember, was quickly overrun by Nazi Germany in 1940. The high power were produced. They got the, the roll marks on there. You'll know if you've got a Nazi one. They were real subject to sabotage, locking lugs, or longer firing pins with the hope that these would go off when a soldier was to reholster it. So check your locking lugs and all that. It's well known. There is a collector's market for that. Not my thing, but your mileage may vary. A first cousin of the high power was developed in Poland in 35 with the help of technicians that went over from FN. It's called the Random. It differed from the original high power. It had an eight shot magazine. I'll try to splash in a picture. It had a grip safety, special hammer release mechanisms. Thousands of these randoms 
were also produced in Nazi occupation when they took over Poland. And just like before, they were sabotaged as well. So if you can ever find any of those or, you know, they're on the market, probably hard to find these days. You want to scrutinize those too for safety. During the war, many of the engineers from FN escaped over to Canada, where they were instrumental in joining another company called John Ingles Company Tooling. And sure enough, they ramped up to produce the high power pistol. Ingles manufactures, goes on to manufacture all of these high powers for the Canadian and actual Chinese forces, as well as an OSS. Again, another high quality production. Quite similar models varying in things like stocks, sights, fittings, and other details start to be made by different companies. After the war, FN goes on to continue manufacturing the handgun in enormous quantities for export, with the high power being adopted as the standard service pistol of somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 countries and untold numbers of law enforcement agencies around the world. The pistol was also adopted by Great Britain and their SAS and many other NATO nations. The high power... For a U.S. perspective, was commercially manufactured at FN in Belgium and was marketed over here in U.S. and Canada by the Browning's Arms Company. So you can kind of see the relationship back and forth there. The prevailing wisdom is the high power didn't catch on in the mid-20th century with America because at the time we were so interested in our 45 ACP and our 44 Magnums, not the European 9mm Parabellum like we are these days. FN continued to make the high power for sale in the U.S., and around the world. Mostly, they started being made and assembled in Portugal decades later, ultimately discontinued in 2018. <sighs> but the story doesn't end there. <laughs> no, it doesn't. With the shooting and the firearms industry in the U.S. having now solidly embraced non-mill cartridge, today's modern era, we see that FN and Springfield have both released new and updated high powers. Springfield calls theirs the SA-35. FN America calls theirs the high power probably due to the naming rights. Both companies have created all steel versions. They're very modernized, refined. They're improved, high power designs, so they can suit today's shooters. You will see things such as increased magazine capacity. The Springfield is a 15 plus one, and the FN actually has a 17 plus one, respectively. All right, the gun is unloaded. Let's go ahead and see if you check it. Okay. Now that we got the history, history lesson out of the way, what you're going to see here is it's a Fabrique National. So it's an FN high power, which is what I love. I had to jump on it in order to get into the game. So that's what I recommend for you. If you're a collector, go ahead and pick one up if you don't already have one. This one was purchased from Classic Firearms roughly three years ago when they were moving a lot, getting a lot more product in. These days are more modernized. That's just an observation. Your mileage, as I always like to say, may vary. This was actually a police surplus trade-in. And you're going to be able to see that because you'll see all the holster wear. Now, these are aftermarket grips. I swapped those out. And you can see the wear and tear. It's been painted over. Uh, and unfortunately, it was dropped too. I got some dings there and there. But I uh, wish that wasn't the case. That's the only thing that bothers me. But hey, character, right? Police trade-in. Police surplus trade-in. So it probably comes from one of the European countries. Oh my God, oh, I like that. In terms of specs on the gun, it's going to be like a full size 1911. Seven and three quarter inch frame, four and three quarter inch barrel, about an inch and a half in width, five inches tall, external hammer. Uh, weight on this, you're going to notice how it feels. See this wide grips. Man, if you got smaller hands, this is going to fit perfectly. And I think this is what a lot of shooters really appreciate about the high power grips and the width of the frame back here it just fits so well in your hand it, it does it does i think that lends itself to why it was so adopted all around the world for all those years lightweight 31 ounces empty 37 ounces full with a full mag and it presents well i've shot this 500 rounds multiple shooters Bring it out more of a novelty for me but i got no problem shooting it but that's just end up shooting other things these days as you guys can tell mag capacity as we spoke about 13. now that's where it gets interesting i'll show you something this is the metcar mag right it does come with the original now that's not serial numbered but you can see the original magazines there this was a blued 13 round magazine that i got aftermarket from midwest gunworks back in the day i think it was 20 bucks here's a nice nice coating nickel coating it's about 22 bucks back in the day. Also 13 rounds. 
helps it eject a little smoother. That was what I was thinking. I was basically trying different magazines to see what worked and what didn't. This one's also kind of interesting. This is a 15 round magazine. So if we compare that to the original 13 rounders, look at that exact same. So no issues. Yep. You can modernize your high power so it carries as much as a Glock 19. So it gets you up to 15 rounds of magazine capacity. So there you go. There's nothing wrong with that. Overall purchase price on this for me back in my day was 619 bucks plus tax. So 619. I figured that was a good deal. I had to jump on it. I was able to pick up an aftermarket holster. My guys at Green Forest Tactical. I did get a forward cant on that. I'm not so much a forward cant guy these days. It's got the belt loops, OWB rig, and fits perfectly. You can hear the snap. I like that. Trigger pull weight. Trigger pull weight. Now, disclaimer, this is not going to be like a SIG Legion where you get this great, fantastic trigger. Just remember the time. This was the original era right after the 1911s. So trigger's a little, a little crunchy. All right, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say it's that smooth. But I'm going to tell you, when in the process of shooting, it's perfect. Fine. No issues. If I do resets on this, like look at the reset. Right, so it's got a lot of take up and a break, a little bit of over travel, <laughs> but this is a different era, right? So there you go. In terms of condition overall, as we spoke about, as we work around the gun, magazine release, it's, it's forceful. Nice, positive magazine ejection, knurled magazine release button. Back strap, unlike a 1911, right? You see how they moved away from that? They didn't have that on this. The grip safeties, nice wide front strap, no checkerization there, only on the grips. And then what's interesting about this is you can look at the years, right? The born on date. They had, a t they had the originals and like a T-series. This is actually a C-series and I don't mind showing you my serial number. For this particular one, that 75 was a year it was made. This was roughly 47 years old at this point. So a newer high power, but made in 1975. That's pretty cool. I really like it. You can see where it was dropped. Remember, this was used by his police department. So if it helped a police officer in the line of duty, no, I, I actually like that. We all know what we need to go do now. So go ahead and stand by. Let's head out to the range and shoot this legendary gun. What do you say? Stand by. At my home stomping grounds here at Point Blank Range in Matthews, North Carolina. What's really cool is if you pick up the good membership is you can get a locker, store some of your stuff. It's very helpful for me. Ready to rock and roll. It's gonna be fun to shoot the high power. All right, we're at the range. A couple things that I forgot to talk about earlier when we were doing the tabletop. The high power, you would carry it with the safety on. There is a safety right here. You would engage it like so. All right, cocked and locked, one in the chamber, hammer locked back, put on your safety, reholster. okay? And, oh, another thing, trigger pull weight. Trigger pull weight for me when I put on the gauge was roughly seven, seven and a half pounds. That's fairly common. So for those of us that like the five to six pound triggers or even less, that's not gonna be the case with your high power. All right, in terms of target and ammo, we've, we're gonna put our target out. We're gonna be shooting 124 grain Norma ammo. That's made in Hungary. All right, let's send it out. Get ready to rock and roll. Oh, and since we're fighting on the good side, the allies, right? We're going to call this, what's our favorite guy, Brad Pitt, say? Nazis. This guy in red is a Nazi. You know what we're going to do, right? We're going to do the Mozambique drill. You guys ever heard of that? These days, it's called a failure drill. So you do two to the body. It's combat, right? This is war. If the guy is still coming, then you go for the immobilizing shot. 
in the head. And I'm trying not to say two to the body, one to the head, because that's ridiculous. In combat and in real life, personal protection, you shoot and tell you what? Stop the threat, right? So anyway, this is gonna be a failure drill. All right, let's light it up. All right. Wish us luck, let's get on it. 30 feet. A lot, a lot of stuff fails. You're in combat, you're down to your pistol. Hopefully that never happens to any of us. Now this gun is really light. So you focus on my grip. Kill us some Nazis. You guys see the results. Let's try that again. Ooh, got a failure to see. Let's try that again. Um, my first observation is, I haven't shot this gun in a while. My first observation is, because it's li it's a lighter gun and I'm shooting 124 grain, I actually feel the kick pretty good. Okay, so I had a couple, I was shooting here, I took my eye off the front side a little bit, so I dropped, but then our, uh, Looks like a keyhole there. So I will take that. I think that constitutes a, a dead Nazi. Don't you guys? <laughs> All right. There's your failure drill. It's pretty interesting, right? So remember two to the body, the guy's still coming at you and you gotta take him out right in the vitals up in the ocular cranial cavity. Disable and stop the threat. Give that a shot. You can actually work that on the timer if you have one, if you're in a range and you can employ that without other people going off and messing your timer up. But you have a part time of 2.5 seconds drawing from the holster. So I know some ranges don't allow you to do that unless you get pre-qualified, that sort of thing. But I'm sure you can find a spot indoors, outdoors. Yeah, give that a shot. My best time is 2.16 I'm proud of that. I'm not a uh, Jerry Mitchell X, Speedy Gonzalez guy, but I beat the part time, so I'm happy with that. All right, uh, just for grins, let's run. I kind of took an insert out of a box of ammo. I'm gonna put it here. We're gonna send this target out 45 feet. We're just gonna work old school, fundamental, iron sight, front sight focus, which is something I haven't done in a while. It's kind of hard, right? Our eyesight's plays on us. We don't have two focal planes. With a red dot, it's kind of easy. Demystify some things. You got one focal plane, which is the bad guy, the target. But the front side, you gotta actually have that front side laser front side focus. So I need to try to do that on this black, <laughs> old school, high power, rounded side. So wish me luck. We'll send this guy out to 45 feet. It's really small. I'm hoping that we can hit it. Let's see. Wish me luck. Woo, that's far. <laughs> I definitely need glasses to see that. I think I got it. This gun is shooting better, guys. It's shooting better. Let me put my safety on. Ah, there's my safety. All right, let's bring it in. Woo! God, dog. I didn't think I could do it. And I promise this was one take. <laughs> I did it. There you go. We're gonna stop it there. You can definitely see, right? You can definitely see what John Browning and Save brought to us, to the table with this gun almost 100 years ago. The magazine count, the nine millimeter parabellum round. Another thing too, the ease of disassembly, I didn't go through that in the video, but a lot easier than your traditional 1911. There's no front bushings, uh, the, there's no D-link, the locking lug is fixed to the barrel. So there's a lot of improvements in this particular pistol 
that you can kind of see allowed it to be a generational leap forward, especially the high capacity magazines, 13 rounds. And then these days with certain follower adjustments and springs, 15 rounds, you can definitely see why the high power is back, right? It was had a long service life in the militaries or in police agencies around the world kind of went away and there must have been some demand from these manufacturers. So we know of at least three manufacturers as I said earlier in the tabletop, Springfield, EAA, forgot to mention them, and FN, they brought it back, but they made some improvements. A couple of them stayed true to the original designs. The FN, they really modernized it. They changed it around, added a lot of features. Now, I don't know if they've added things like the ability to put on a, a weapons mounted light or anything like that. You can go check them out and see. But who doesn't love a high power? And if you don't own one, you should think about getting one now, especially one of the modern ones, or if you wanna go classic. So let me know down below, what, what do you have? If you're a collector and you have a whole bunch of them, what's your nicest one? As always, like and subscribe to the channel, help us grow. We really appreciate you. I'm going on vacation. Had to get this video done. Until next time, we're out of here. Take care of yourselves. See ya.